And now it's my great, great pleasure to introduce Alex Waterman, whose practice centers on music as the social body sounding. He's an active, he's actually active as a cellist, a composer, an interpreter, a musicologist, a teacher, and a writer. We are back to David Deutsch, many parallel realities. He's a founding member of the Plus Minus Ensemble in London and Brussels, the Either R Ensemble in New York, and also founded the record label and publishing company DS Alcoda with Dexter Sinister. He often collaborates with others to produce books, films, compositions, including the artist Beatrice Gibson, and also the typographer Will Holder, who, as you know, has designed this year's marathon program and will also design the catalog. Will and Alex are currently producing a book about the American opera composer Robert Ashley, someone in whom also Philippe Pareno and Henri Sala are very interested in. In December 2011, Alex will direct a new Spanish version of Robert Ashley's television opera, Perfect Lives, at the Arundel Theatre in Brooklyn. For tonight, Alex will present Beacons of His Ancestorships, which is an ongoing film script based on the poem in Sarah, Mencken, Christ and Beethoven, There Were Men and Women, by John Barton Volgamot, and is an attempt to bring to life Volgamot's elaborate memory theatre through the creation of over 1,000 imagined gardens and landscapes. A very, very warm welcome to Alex Waterman. Forgotten that I'd written that introduction, so I, I'm going to save a little bit of the the uh, the background of the story of John Barton Wolgamott, But I do want to read um, from the pages of the, the original poem, uh, which inform the particular scenes which I'm going to be reading from in the film script. Um, so this is from In Sarah Mencken Christ and Beethoven. There were men and women. And I'm just going to read the first two pages. In its very truly great manners of Ludwig van Beethoven, very heroically, the very cruelly ancestral death of Sarah Powell Hart had very ironically come amongst his very really grand men and women to Raphael Sabatini, George Ada, Margaret Storm Jameson, Ford Maddox Hoofer, Jean-Jacques Bernard, Louis Bromfield, Friedrich Wilhelm Nietzsche, and Helen Brown Norton, very titanically. In her very truly great manners of John Barton Wolgamott, very heroically, Helen Brown Norton had very originally come amongst his very really grand men and women to Lodovico Ariosto, Solon, Matteo Maria Bocchiardo, Philo Judeus, Roger Bacon, Longus, Simeon Strunsky, and Johann von Goethe, very titanically. Uh, Wolgamott's poem is a series of uh, names, um, almost all of them are writers, and all of these names, all of these proper names, become uh, images um, in, in the sense that they are strung together as memory images. So I decided that I would put them together into a film script and that each image would become a landscape or a garden that would represent these people inside of the inside of a landscape. So um, because there's so much in a name, um, I also uh, have been doing ongoing bibliographic research into the works of these writers and to find what are the connections between all of them. Um, because it is in Sarah, Mencken, Christ, and Beethoven that all of these men and women exist. And one final note before I begin. Um, instead of doing this as a radio play, which is one of the options which I normally choose, um, I decided that I would use two landscapes or in particular two gardens uh, from here in London, and ones which um, uh, I treasure. Uh, one is Beatrice Gibson's garden, um, which I recorded in the early mornings. Um, and uh, so that's the first landscape that you'll hear. And the second, or the first Hortus Conclusus, the second is um, inside of Celine Condorelli's apartment, um, which I also consider a garden of sorts. Um, she has a, a beautiful camera obscura that, that brings Rosebery Avenue into her apartment 
And there, one day when I was stuck here in London, um, unable to get home uh, because of the volcano, uh, I decided to listen to Walter Marchetti's Natura Morta. And it was such an incredible day, and I opened the windows and let in the rest of the world and um, decided I would record my listening. So that's the other uh, that's the other soundtrack that you'll hear to accompany. Beethoven and Sarah. Scene one, morning, fade in. Sounds of a hoe breaking the earth, feet shuffling. Heavy sounds breathing and intermittent fragments of melodies are heard as the gardener hums. We see a small plot of land enclosed by a high garden wall. A garden shed is in the right-hand corner of the screen. The fog is lifting in the early light. An old man in overalls is working on his patch of beets. The pace is slow. After some time, he leans the hoe against the shed and goes in to make himself a cup of coffee. The stove is against the back wall. There is a kettle and a small pot. On the counter is an old metal can and a grinder. On the left wall, we see a photo of a plantation in the American South. Set back from the fields is a large house with pillars. It looks like it's morning, late morning. In the foreground are seven or eight slaves bent over picking cotton with heavy sacks on their backs. Two are standing looking out at the camera. On the porch in the distance, we see a couple having coffee. The man has a cigar in his mouth and is bent over a low table writing something. The woman holds her cup and saucer and looks out towards the field. We hear the sound of beans dropping one by one into a cup. The gardener mumbles as he drops them. 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 4, 55, 6. He then transfers the beans from the cup to the grinder and begins to turn the handle. The water is heating on the stove. The ground coffee is poured into the little pot and water is added as he stirs as it is prepared. We see only the back of the man in his hands in this entire scene. At the end of the scene, the camera follows the full cup in his hand to his lips. He drinks, fade to black. We hear the sound of a plane crashing close by. Titles, beacons of ancestorship. Sounds of the crash, birds and fragments of the Eroica Symphony playing on an old radio. After the titles, the quote following appears on the screen. True wildness is like true gold. It will bear the trial of Dewey Decimal. Raphael Sabatini, Lance's garden. Crash site, a field outside the beet patch. Parts of a crashed RAF plane lay strewn across a field of young wheat. The field is an electric color of green that just dusts the tops of the clods of dirt as if it had been airbrushed on. The plane is still smoldering and the smoke mixes with the lifting fog. Jean-Jacques Bernard, garden detail at Herrenhausen. In the foreground, a party has gathered. Two ladies have their backs to us. They are talking to two gentlemen. One has his hands on his hips and appears to be listening to the other who is turned slightly towards the scene in front with his arm gesturing towards it, but with his head turned towards the two ladies to whom he is recounting something or merely presenting the scene in front of them. To the left of the group, a little boy holds the hand of the lady on the left, whilst extending a droopy outstretched hand to a seated dog whose snout extends as if sniffing his flaccid fingers. To the left of, the, of this group are two men, one standing, the other seated on a wheelbarrow. The man stands with his hat in his left hand, turned three quarters towards the viewer, his right hand rests on a cane. His right leg has taken a step forward and he appears to be directing attention towards or about to walk over to the other group. The man in the wheelbarrow is in the shade and appears to be resting, softly observing the group from a distance. Stretch out in the front of the party is a terraced garden with 14 statues in varying active poses, seven on each side. At the end of the garden are four more figures in front of a stone fence, enclosing the space. To either side of the terrace in the foreground are two statues of girls. They are not on pedestals and face out towards the viewer at the very edge of the page and tucked into the hedges that line the terrace on two sides. The sky is slightly cloudy 
and the shadows are long. It is late in the afternoon, on what has been a sunny day. Overhead in the distance, just above and to the right of the vanishing point, are five birds flying in silhouette. Wolgamot. Exterior. A palace set onto a natural terrace overlooking a lower park. The great cascade flows out from under the palace. The water that feeds the fountains comes from a canal that runs from the gulf. The cascade is the first in a series of fountains, trick fountains, basins, and reservoirs. The gardens are populated by more than 200 statues, some from Greek mythology, some of great writers, others of characters from popular stories and myths. At the very edge of the garden, tucked away in a wooded corner, seated by a quiet pond inside a cave shaped like a tear, is the figure of a woman carved out of white stone, gazing down into the water. Sarah, front porch, southern plantation. Close-up shot of a woman's reflection in a cup of tea. The drop of a cube of sugar in the, cu in the cup fractures it, it. As the image settles, as the contents settle, <laughs> and the image, she stirs and then lifts the cup to her lips and sips slowly. The opening chord of a symphony momentarily overpowers the sound of work and singing in the fields. She returns the teacup to the saucer on the table, and from a different angle we see a detail of the ornately leaved capital of a pillar reflected in the tea as it becomes still, fade. Lodovico Ariosto, Dream, Canto 34. A palace is perched on a cliff set into a forest. Above the forest, a chariot in the clouds. On the field in front of the palace, a flying creature has landed and a knight bows to a lord. Below the cliff, rocky crevices split open. Their sharp tooth-like verticality are terrifying and foreboding. Emerging from a gaseous and flaming fissure in a rock is a naked demon in flames. A knight in armor is taken by surprise by the rising of this creature. His horse, which is tethered to the rocks behind him, is also frightened and shakes her head wildly, trying to rip herself loose. Solon, interior of the palace. We enter the library of the palace. The shelves are lined with hundreds of large, sealed glass tubes filled with loose pages, foreign notes, currency, fabrics, dirt, spices, rocks, liquids, gems, seeds, grasses, eggshells of all sizes, and shards of many kinds of mirrored glass, lenses, fossils. The library is round, and at the center is a podium that resembles a decorative birdbath made of a thin, luminous marble. It glows in the candlelight. The ceiling is made up of knots of pneumatic tubing delivering the tubes to chambers throughout the massive palace. The sounds are of the, pneumatic, the pneumatics running and the soft footsteps of the librarians, an occasional clinking of glass as tubes hit one another or are filled by the archivist with new materials. Roger Bacon, interior room, empty white plaster walls marble floors. A small table in the center of the room sits in front of a window. On the tabletop is a camera obscura. The long black velvet curtains are drawn except for a slant of light that hits the box. On the opposite wall, a sundial is projected onto it. The room is the quietest in the house. Time passes soundlessly as light and shadow. Wogamot light flickering in a dusty old cinema. We have a close-up static shot. Particles of dust dance and collide inside the column of light on its route halfway to the screen. Thomas Stearns Eliot. A drained pool in the garden, cracked concrete. In dark corners of the dry pool, some water gathers and reflections of the sky glimmer from their depth. Music emanates from a bush. The garden is full of echoes. Robert Southey, exterior, wide shot of street in Bristol, children playing, close up of sign that reads, Wine Street. The camera starts to wind through the streets down to the harbor. We are now at the floating harbor in Bristol. Voiceover reads from Letters from England by Don Manuel Abrez Espriella. The harbor, which is very fine, is commanded by the castle of Perdenes. 
Near its mouth, there is a single rock on which a pole is erected because it is covered at high tide. A madman, not many years ago, carried his wife here at low water, landed her on the rock, and rode away in sport. Nor did he return till her danger, as well as fear, had become extreme. Cut to exterior shot of an inn by the harbor. The voiceover continues. The perpetual stir and bustle in this inn is as surprising as it is wearisome. Doors opening and shutting, bells ringing, voices calling to the waiter from every quarter while he cries, coming, to one room and then hurries away to another. Everybody is in a hurry here. Either they are going off in their packets or are ha hastening their preparations to embark, or they have just arrived and are impatient to be on the road homeward. Every now and then a carriage rattles up to the door with a rapidity which makes the very house shake. The man who cleans the boots is running in one direction, the barber with his power bag in another. Here goes the barber's boy with his hot water and razors. There comes the clean linen from the washerwoman, and the hall is full of porters and sailors bringing in their luggage or bearing it away. Now you hear a horn blow because the post is coming in. And in the middle of the night, you are awakened by another because it is going out. Nothing is done in England without a noise, and yet noise is the only thing they forget in the bill. Dunsany, a courtyard. Feathers of every variety strewn in a courtyard. Pools of ink gather in between the stones. A crumpled hat lies in the southwest corner. Charles Dodgson and Blaise Pascal. Garden of migraines. The far end of a long English garden, at the end of the path running along the black back fence, is a craps board that is painted onto the grass. The dice and cane are huge in scale. The words and numbers are painted onto the ground. Two men play together. As the dice are thrown, they become larger as they roll away from the players, and smaller as they roll towards them. This is an effect of convergence accommodative micropsia, which is a physiologic phenomenon in which an object appears smaller as it approaches the subject. Charles and Blaise, the two players, use different mathematical formulas to predict their chances of winning, but are consistently thrown by the hallucinatory qualities of the game that they are playing. Phidias Suxus Aretino Michelangelo, interior courtyard of a large palace. Angels dangle from the ceiling over a large statue of Athena. Around the courtyard are galleries with reproductions of sculptures of Michelangelo and others. There are two painters at work, working from live models. In the first painting, we see Aphrodite as an old woman. Next to her is a still life on a huge table, full of ripe roots and palm fronds, game, and cheeses. On the other side of the table is the other scene being painted, a frieze of Eros, crowned with roses, Alcimene, Menelas, a Greek athlete, Pan, Marcius, in chains, and an old woman who is reading a book with plates of old pornographic drawings. Both painters are chuckling to themselves as they work. From time to time, they pluck a grape from the still life or take a bite of a pear. Their laughter grows as they continue painting. Choking, one faints. The other continues to laugh, but lacking breath turns red, then scarlet. Shaking more and more violently, he falls over and becomes quite still. The models remain in their poses. The old woman gasps and turns the page. A pear rolls off the table. Leon Cavallo, Hannay, and Frentzen. Exterior, circus, aerial shots over old mines and strip mall. Birmingham, Alabama. A circus is set up in the dirt. It, a circus is set up in the dirt lot behind the Walmart supercenter off of Highway 65. Across the highway, old quarries lay dormant. Each pond a different shade of blue, green, turquoise, peacock blue. Brilliant like gemstones when seen, seen from the air. In this aerial shot, the roads and trails carved into the landscape look like intricate Celtic knots. Exterior, evening. It is twilight and the circus tent is going up. The clowns are practicing juggling and the barn swallows are flying overhead. The sound of the highway is in the distance and occasionally when the wind blows, you can hear the intercom at the drive through McDonald's by the highway. Meyerbeer. Dissolved to blue grid of latticed skylight. Music changes to Giacomo Meyerbeer's Mi bate il cor o paradiso. 
As the camera pulls back, we are in the lavish Baroque lobby of the Mayflower Hotel in Washington, D.C. In the frame is a large oriental rug, young cherry trees and planters, pillars with gilt gold capitals, and a gallery above with ornate iron railing. Next to a table is a lamp with two Grecian youths with loosely draped clothing melting off their midsections. They gaze up at the tree of candles above them. They hold on to the bow of the candelabra that bears fruits and sensual drooping leaves hanging from individual branches of each candle. There's no one in the lobby. On the wall, up in the gallery, above a plush chair, there's a framed picture of a war vessel beached on a beautiful island shore. There are palms and coconuts lying in the foreground. Dane, Asbury, Follett, Callaghan. Exterior shot of hammock hanging from two trees. As the camera zooms out to a wider shot, we see the back of a small house. There's a makeshift boxing ring set up next to a chicken coop. The floor is made of old crates and plywood nailed onto the crates. It's midday and the sun is high. The yard is only populated by some hens and a cock pecking at the dirt. There's a small transistor radio in the window of the house playing very low. It sits next to a copy of Follett's Modern American Usage, which props the window open. The camera moves through the back door and along a long co dark corridor past a kitchen on the left and three closed doors on the right. There's a small living room at the end of the hall on the right with a baby grand piano and stacks of magazines on each wall. There's a reading chair surrounded by piles of magazines. The entrance hall is to the left and it seems large for the size of the house. The camera moves through the screen door and out onto the porch. The sound of traffic hits us. To the right is a busy avenue with cars and trucks. To the left is a highway that is recessed and runs underneath the avenue. Crossing over the bridge, over the highway, we reach the walls of a Catholic cemetery. As we enter the cemetery, the music of Bach begins to play. Exterior shot, Catholic cemetery, next to the highway. As the camera moves through the cemetery, the sound of the highway and major roads recede behind us. Bach's aria from BWV 211 begins playing, Ai wie schmeckt der Kaffee Susa. The camera slowly stops and pans up to the treetops where the leaves are blowing gently in the late afternoon light. Fade to black, end part one.